Hello and welcome to uh, my living room because my wife is transitioning to working primarily from home and uh, now we have to share my office. <laughs> so the office is in a bit of a state right now while we figure out how to work around each other in it and where she's going to fit. Um, <laughs> so no beautiful wall of books but beautiful yellow wall instead and welcome to my green sofa and yes that is my laptop cable. Uh, <laughs> but anyway. Um, <laughs> I actually wanted to talk about something that I think, I don't know, I feel like it's a weird one anyway. So welcome to a weird space for a weird conversation. Um, I don't know how many books I've sold. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've seen people doing the video where they're like, I sold this many books. Ah, and I'm just like, I've sold some books. <laughs> <laughs> and like I could do the maths, don't get me wrong, I absolutely could do the maths and I'm sure most of these people aren't like tracking it book by book by book, they're doing the maths at some point. At some undisclosed time of their career they've decided that this is the optimum time to look at how many books they have sold and they've gone through and figured it out. I have not done that and in all honesty I probably won't. So the only amount of books sold that I track is books I have physically sold in person at an event and to be fair books that I have sold through my online signed bookshop and the reason that I track those is primarily an in income. <laughs> Try again. Inventory uh, measurement. So I, so that I know how many books I have and also as a marker for how many books to take to another event. So like, for example, I went to buy Pride UK in 2023, right? And I sold a number of books. And then when I went to buy Pride in 2024, I took the equivalent of that number of books of new books. Does that make sense? I did actually end up selling out, so I should have taken more. But, <laughs> but I took so I saw I'm just gonna I'm just gonna give you numbers I don't know why I'm being cagey about this at Buy Pride 2023 the most amounts of books of any of my series that I sold was unlicensed delivery which was exclusive early access editions of unlicensed delivery which is exactly the same as the regular access ones except that you get them early and they have a sticker on that says they're early access um but <laughs> those sold nine copies and everything else sold less than that so and the maximum I sold of any of the other books that I took with me was four. So what I did was I took 10 of each of my pirate books, one of which was exclusive early access and the other of which had only come out in April. So no one at Buy Pride had seen them before unless they've seen me somewhere else or followed me online or whatever, whatever. I took 10 of each of those, 10 unlicensed deliveries, just in case Buy people really like sci-fi, uh, five Welcome to Humanities because it didn't sell that well the previous year and five of each piece of the Guardian Cadet series. So 10 Guardian Cadets overall, but five Breaking the Curses, five Finding the S, right? I sold out of <laughs> not, the not the Fighting Kinds and Welcome to Humanities and didn't sell out of anything else, but I did sell one of everything. I might, I didn't sell any Finding the Airs either, actually, to be fair. Last year, somebody bought the Guardian Cadet bundle, but I don't think I made it clear enough that I had bundles this year. I'm still figuring this stuff out. But talking to other authors, as I have been doing, finally, <laughs> um, talking to other authors, it looks like a lot of people are actively counting how many books they're selling, including through things like Amazon KDP and Ingram Spark and Draft to Digital. They're actively going through and finding out how many books they've sold on the regular, it seems. And maybe I'm misinterpreting this, but that's what it looks like from the outside. And I am not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and like I just sort of wanted to to converse mostly with myself because unfortunately I can't hear you while I'm making the video um about the possible reasons and logics behind these kinds of things and why stuff works for some people and doesn't work for other people and it's basically the same like I don't want to turn you off straight at the beginning of the video but it's basically the same concept that I have for a lot of these different kinds of videos where I'm there like basically fundamentally what it comes down to is 
different processes work for different people and I'm still trying to find the right process for me, but it's going pretty well so far. <laughs> um, like, like I have with the whole pantsing a novel versus outlining a novel and I'm there like, don't make me outline, I can't do it. And other people are there like, I can't even begin to think that anyone could pants a novel. And if you don't know what pantsing a novel is, it's writing a novel by the seat of your pants, AKA without an outline. And yes, I do think it's a very stupid term. So, <laughs> when it comes to counting books, why am I not doing it, right? That begins, like, that's the question that I ended up asking myself today, just before I made this video. The question I ended up asking myself was, is it normal that everybody else seems to be counting books? And I am not. And the answer is, what is normal? <laughs> Really, genuinely, that is the answer. The answer is, okay, explore the why, right? Like, if you can explore the why and it still makes sense that you're not doing it, it's probably fine. And if you can explore the why and you start realising why these people are doing it and you're thinking, oh man, I need a piece of that pie. I don't know where that phrase came from, but sure. I need a piece of that pie. You can start doing it because you understand the why. And this is pretty much how I live my whole life. <laughs> is in within the whys. So I asked myself, why are these authors counting their books, right? Is it just for bragging rights? I sold 60,000, I sold a million, I sold however many books. And like, yes is definitely an answer to that question. But I don't think yes is the only answer to that question. So what's the other part, right? And the other part lies in something that I think is really important mm -hmm. and I never talk about. And that is, what is your aim for being an author, right? Especially as an indie author, but as any author really, what is your aim? Because some of us want to make this a full-time gig or at least our only job. <laughs> I'm gonna phrase it that way, actually. Some of us wanna make this our only job, no other jobs, and to be able to live on it, right? And some people just wanna do it because they wanna share their stories with the world. We live under a capitalist society, so both of these things can happen in a way that potentially, like, potentially I would be on a different end of this if I didn't need money to survive. But I do need money to survive because food is costly and shelter is costly and electricity is costly and I need all of those things if I'm gonna write books. Um, <laughs> so, okay. In that case, with us looking at things on this spectrum from where the ends I posit are, wants to make this their only job and doesn't want to make this a job at all, <laughs> for publishing books. Where does counting books come into this? Well, it tends to fall on the wants this to be their only job end of the spectrum. I think all of this is very much my own opinions and thought processes. So with the thought process in mind that people are wanting to make this their permanent, their only job. I keep wanting to say full time. That's not what I actually mean. <laughs> their, their only job. What's the purpose of counting books? Well, the purpose of counting books in that situation is actually just as nonsensical as I think it is. <laughs> Not in a mean way. I know that for a lot of people, what counting books actually does is it gives them a really easy graphic in their head of how much they need to survive, right? So say you earn nice, even numbers from all of your books. Say you earn one pound per book sold to through an independent bookshop or a chain bookshop, through a physical bookshop, right? Like a bookshop. I don't know why I was trying to give you an example of a bookshop, but through a bookshop, you earn one pound for each of those, which is fairly average for a lot of people. <laughs> so say you earn a pound from every book sold. And you're thinking, I need 50,000 pounds a year to survive. Or to thrive, or to live in the conditions that my job would allow me to live in. Which, to be fair, I'm, 
have never in my life earned £50,000 a year and neither has my wife. But it's a nice round number, so we're working in round numbers here. Say you need £50,000 a year to live and you get £1 per book. And imagine for a moment you have no expenses to consider. Which is not the case. And imagine for a moment you have no taxes to consider because we're trying to do easy maths here. You would need to sell 50,000 books, right? One pound per book, 50,000 pounds a year, you need to sell 50,000 books, right? Great. You can very easily picture what 50,000 books looks like. Well, actually, no, that's quite hard to picture, but you can picture it in books. And if you break it down month by month, unfortunately, there are 12 months and I'm not going to do that maths on camera. <laughs> but you can break it down month by month and see how many months how many books per month you would need to sell. Or you can break it down like event by event if you're going to events and see how many books you need to sell. Or you can get to this point of the year, which is probably November, isn't it? <laughs> and you can figure like, oh, hey, guess what? That means I need to sell this many books by the end of the year to make it up to that. And say you actually are considering taxes and expenses and stuff um, <laughs> because you really should. And say you're thinking, right, so I only get to keep like 50% of what I would earn, one pound per book, I only get to keep 50% of that. Um, there's bunny ears because taxes are complicated and expenses are complicated and I'm trying to keep things really simple. So we're just splitting it right in half. You need to sell 100,000 books, right? That's even harder to picture, but for a lot of people, that is easier to consider than I need to earn 100,000, but I need to earn, I need to intake hundred thousand pounds to then have taxes and expenses and whatever whatever and to come away with approximately fifty thousand pounds and again these are not real numbers well they are real in the form of they are mathematical concepts <laughs> but they're not real numbers and that this is not part of my actual expenses and income reports or my taxable income or any of that stuff this is so much more complicated than just fifty percent of it goes elsewhere <laughs> but for the simplicity of the the thought process of why do people count their books, that's, I think, a big part of it, is that it is easier to think about how many books you sold at an event than it is to think about how much money you, well, not even at an event. Right. A lot of the authors I talk to I've met at events, so um, that, the number of books that you have sold rather than the, the money you have taken in as a business. And I also know that that is just one too many numbers for my dyslexic brain to contemplate. <laughs> because, I think because partially, I have to contemplate my inventory stock. So like, I know right now, this minute, when I'm talking to the camera, that I am running low on some of the books I have in my inventory. And I need to buy more of them. <laughs> And I know how much that is gonna cost. It's not a fun number. <laughs> and I know how much money is in my book spending amount. And these things do not currently mesh because of the way that taxes work and because of the way that my brain works for taxes. And I'm not gonna explain that because that's, because A, it's not a sensible system and B, I don't want anyone to follow it because it's not a sensible system. <laughs> and C, I don't want to admit it in case I'm doing it wrong because the way to find out you're doing your taxes wrong is definitely not via YouTube. <laughs> the way to find out I'm doing my taxes wrong is by asking my uh, brother who runs a financial organization. I don't actually know what he does, but I think he's an accountant. Or my dad, who was a business accountant for his entire life. Uh, his entire career was business accountancy. So I've got people I can ask and I've got people I will ask. Also, my mum was self-employed, so I'm pretty like steady across the board of people who can tell me I'm doing it wrong. Don't need to put it out on YouTube for everyone to tell me I'm doing it wrong. Because um, I've been advised to do things a certain way and I don't think it's a sensible way, but it's the advice that I have right now. So I'm just working with it. Um, but I think the other reason, other than it being easier to contemplate 100,000 books than it is to contemplate 100,000 pounds of income or takings, because income and takings are a technically different thing. Um, <laughs> I think the other reason that a lot of people are counting their books sold 
is I was going to phrase it one way but I'm going to phrase it this way instead is the feeling of success that might come with that so being able to say to yourself to other people to your doubting parent <laughs> not saying which of my five parents in my life are doubting but <laughs> there's definitely some um, or like boast at your stepsister's wedding that's coming up soon uh, how many books you've sold like that is definitely a, a thing I think for a lot of people like oh how's your how's your business going because that's that's what people ask how's your business going well how's that whole author thing going I've had that one as well which I don't love um and like I tend to take that opportunity because of the way my brain works to be there like oh it's going pretty well I have six books out I'm bringing out book number seven in time period oh yeah what's the seventh one about are they all in the same series you know this leads on to questions more about like what are the books about which I'm really comfortable talking about this is what I do uh, <laughs> um than it does businessy conversations which I find very difficult to keep up with because like I said a bunch of my family members are in finance and I am not at all in finance I I got my maths GCSE uh when I was doing my GCSEs he did a physics AS level uh when I was doing my A levels I did physics AS and then I dropped it the subsequent year so I didn't get full physics A level even though what I really desperately wanted actually out of my physics A level was a, a astrophysics <laughs> and I, I didn't get to do that because that was in your A2 rather than your AS if you don't know what these qualifications are it does not matter um <laughs> but I wanted to get the astrophysics course that was what was really interesting and I just could not make it through another year of physics because it was so maths heavy and it really relied on you also doing an A level in maths and I was not doing an A level in maths I was doing an A level in drama and in classical studies <laughs> so I swapped for something else uh, but most of my family are really really maths brained people uh, I am the oddball. Who's surprised? <laughs> um, although to be fair, they are all book lovers as well. Like no one in my family is like no one in my family. Everybody in my family is a big reader. Um, so you know, uh, I'm not that much of an oddball. Um, but yeah, like getting into these financial and businessy conversations with them is quite difficult because either they are like PAYE employees who don't really get how independent businesses work which is normal and fine. Or they are people who've started their own business, but like 10 years before I started mine, and have kind of forgotten what it's like to be in the beginning stages and or had more money to start than I did. Um, and or it's not a creative career. So it's much, not easier, I don't want to say easier, but I guess more stable is what I want to say. It's a more stable environment to build a business in. Like people are always going to want accountants or finance people I don't know what they do um <laughs> whereas like and I think people are always going to want books as well but I think that the fundamental sales of each of these things is very very different uh not easier or harder just very very different and it's very difficult to then have like a a, a straight conversation that's funny because none of us are straight uh, that's not true a bunch of us are straight, but me and the other one who started a business, <laughs> we're not straight. Uh, but it's difficult to have like a a point for point conversation about it because we're at such different stages and we started in such different ways and it's such different industries. So it's just fundamentally it doesn't mesh. Um, so I don't want to have those conversations about like business. I'd rather have conversations about books, you know, and like books are my business, obviously but I don't want to have a conversation about it like it's a business unless it's like for a business purpose. I don't want to have a casual conversation about it as if not as if it's a business. It is a business. <laughs> I don't want to have a conversation, casual conversation or a family conversation about it centered around the idea of the business when I could have a casual or family conversation around it based on the what the book's about and the like story elements of it and practicing my pitch on my family members um, but I know that that's not true for everyone and that there is a certain legitimacy lent to you lent lent 
to you if you are able to, especially to doubting family members, talk in specific numbers. Some parents, I was going to say, some people <laughs> understand things better in consumable numbers. And like, again, for example, with my family, because I love them, um, I know that when they ask me, how's it going? I say, it's going well. <laughs> And then they can ask for follow-up questions or I can immediately jump in with the thing that I feel comfortable talking about. It's going well, I've published six books. Or it's going well, I went to MCM. Or it's going well, I spoke on a podcast. Or it's going well, I've made some author friends. I get to steer the conversation to a specific thing that I'm comfortable with. And I think for people who are counting the number of books they have, that is the way that they're comfortable steering the conversation or they know that that is the thing that is going to lend them legitimacy in these doubting family or friends eyes although why are your friends would doubt you I don't know um <laughs> why you'd be friends with someone who doubts you I suppose is what I mean but like being able to sell sell being able to say I sold I'm just going to keep using the same number 50,000 books this year to a family member who doesn't think that this is a legit career path that's really valuable. In the case of my family, the next question after that would probably be, oh, and how much did you earn? At which point the conversation gets much more finance based. And again, I'm not comfy with that. And like, I thought for a long time that I was going to be one of those people who shared numbers on YouTube because I wanted to be one of those people that had that transparency. And then I realised I don't want to be one of those people. Not because I don't like those people. I love those people. I think those videos are great. I think they're really useful. But I think there's a certain element to them of like success or failure that I just don't want to put myself in the position of. Like I'm comfortable with what my business looks like right now. I'm comfortable with the way that it's going. And I don't want to invite scrutiny on it from, let's be honest, I know some of you, <laughs> but anyone could watch this video. I don't want to invite scrutiny from anyone. These are conversations that I would be much more comfortable having in a closed environment that YouTube just isn't. Um, and that's fine. <laughs> it's a comfort level thing, I think. And it's complicated and finances always are complicated and while I think that it's a great idea to share your salary with your colleagues and by share your salary I don't mean like give them your money I mean tell them how much you're earning so that you know that you're all earning the same on the same level because otherwise there's the chance of you getting ripped off or one of your colleagues getting ripped off and nobody wants that um <laughs> I don't this isn't the same thing because I'm not earning, well, I'm not earning a salary, I'm about to say, but like Amazon KDP is not paying me a salary. Amazon KDP is paying my business money. And then I, as the CEO of my business, sole proprietor of my business, <laughs> the only person who works for my business, I am doing all of the things that need to be done with that money like salaries and expenses and well actually expenses and salary because I'm the only person who works there and if I don't pay myself I just get to do the sad puppy eyes at my wife and say will you feed me again this month and she says yeah <laughs> because we've had a whole conversation about it um <laughs> and about how this works but it's not even a whole conversation we have regular conversations about how it's going she is a big like emotional investor in my business um and like so okay that's too wise it's the the brag or the like comfort or the like um controlling the narrative not controlling the narrative it's the brag or the ability to like stick it to that person that you know who doesn't think this is legit or it's a great way to visualise how much 
you're potentially earning or how much you're potentially taking in or how much more you would need to to be able to match up to the salary that you currently have which again in my head is £50,000 even though I don't earn, I've never earned that uh, <laughs> and my wife doesn't earn that but when that is that is that all the whys right is that all of the whys I can think of and the answer is no <laughs> I have more whys, more potential whys. Um, so another reason that I think that people like to count how many books they've sold rather than just income numbers is because it is... Sorry, someone made a noise outside and immediately my train of thought was just kaput off the rails. I got no idea what I was going to say. <laughs> so I guess I don't have any more whys. Um, but it is, it's the thing. I like to to ask that question, to figure out the whys and to see if, there we go, that's the next bit, because uh, I can't remember what my other why was, to see if that has an impact on whether I think it's something I should be doing or not. Should. Uh. <laughs> whether it's something I think would be useful to me or not. Do I think it would be useful to, to have counted how many books I've sold? And the answer is not at this stage. I don't think it's a bad thing that I don't know the number of books I've sold. I know how many books I sold at Buy Pride. I know how many books I sold at MCM. I know how many books I sold at, just to be clear, MCM is MCM Comic Con, uh, which I really should have said straight off the bat. Because um, <laughs> it's one of their like terms of service is if you're going to talk about them, you're supposed, as a business, you're supposed to talk about them as MCM Comic Con, or actually now it's MCM Comic Con X EGX, which is very long, but that is the way they like to be referred to and I should be doing them that and also at the same time it's a really ingrained habit at this point in my life having gone to 11 years worth of MCM events before I started being a vendor to just call it MCM because everyone who just goes that I've ever met just calls it MCM <laughs> but I mean MCM Comic Con <laughs> XEGX but like, I know how many books I sold at all of these events because I keep a record of it. I total it up at the end of the day or the end of the weekend or the end of whatever. And I use those numbers to help me figure out how many books to take next time or what kinds of expectations to put on these kinds of events. And it's a very useful number to have. And I think that a lot of the time the people who are counting their books sold are using that number in the same way that I use my event specific numbers, where they're using it for something and I just don't know what that something is. And maybe one day I'll figure it out and maybe I won't. I figured out the other why. Rats, hate that. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> The other why is if you're selling in multiple genres like I am, because I write sci-fi and fantasy books and one space fantasy that's upcoming. Um, but if you're writing in multiple genres or you have multiple series, obviously knowing how many of each book you sold or how many like book one to book two and book two to book three ratios you've sold can be really helpful because it allows you to see what your like series retention rate is or see what is apparently appealing to people. And then you can make uh, informed choices about like, is this ad campaign working? Is this series retention good or bad? Why might that be the case? Is this something you wanna continue with? Is this something that appeals to people? Is it not? And the thing is, <laughs> that's a very sensible way to run a business based in creativity, right? Is to look at what people like and and go from there and figure out how to replicate that so people like what you're doing even more, right? And like, I know, for example, that apparently non-binary and bisexual people fucking love pirates. I know that now. I thought it was just me, but apparently it's all of us. <laughs> so people, we, we love pirates, which to be fair, I kind of figured but now I have confirmation. Thank you, Porthos. Now I have confirmation that that is definitely a thing. So logistically, logically, I should continue with pirates, right? That would be a sensible way to run a business. 
But in case you couldn't tell from any of my other videos where I talk about what I'm working on right now, or the fact that I've brought out six books in, what, one, two, three, four series? One of them is a standalone. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't work like that. I can't. I have tried. I did try very hard. I tried very hard with Mary Ellen breaking the curse to Mary Ellen finding the air. I didn't work on anything else. Lies. I tried not to work on anything else while I was in the transitional period from Mary Ellen breaking the curse to Mary Ellen finding the air. And that took me two years. That's not true. It took me 18 months. But still, it took me 18 months to get another book written. In that time, I did technically write a whole nother book, <laughs> but it wasn't the plan. And therein lies a huge problem for me, <laughs> is that I can't just stick to one thing. I never have been able to. I'm not, I'm just not wired that way. And while it would be really beneficial to be able to write more pirates to capitalise on, <laughs> to capitalise on this, my apparent success with pirates, what I actually have nearly ready that I've been working on all this year, not pirates at all. I mean, to be fair, I do have my space pirates, but they're not finished. They're not even close to finished. And I love them. I think they're great, but I don't know when it's going to be done. I'm saying when with all the hope in my heart. Um, <laughs> and I know what's coming next, probably. Except, actually, I still don't know what's coming next. <laughs> Probably what's coming next could be one of these three different things. But that's exactly what I mean. Like, there's no point in me counting how many books I've sold in a particular series and thinking, great, let's continue on with this because it's working really well. Because last time I tried to do that, I didn't publish a book for an entire year. And I don't want to... I want to publish a book every year. <laughs> that's that's my bar that I want to hold myself to. I want to publish a book every year. I don't want to go another year without publishing a book. And is that potentially unsustainable? Sure. Will I be able to hold myself to that? I don't know. I've not been doing this for very long. <laughs> and I just, but I just don't want to pen myself in like that at the to the detriment of my creativity, right? And I think that that it's great that other people don't have that problem. If you don't have that problem, I think that's great. And I also don't think it's weird to have this problem. I think it's a perfectly normal thing to have that, that the way that I write best isn't necessarily the best way to publish things. <laughs> And I think it's one of those things of like, I hope that people will stick with me because they think that my tone of writing is good or because I have said I will do it and I will actually do it. Like, I know that there is one person that follows me online who only wants to read the IPA books and I am working on them. Partly because I know there is at least one person who follows me who only wants to read the IPA books. And I want to provide because A, I love those books. And B, I don't want to disappoint this person. And C, I said I was going to do more of them. <laughs> and I have all of these ideas and I'm working on all of these ideas. But the thing is, is that it's just... The IPA is really going to benefit from my wife working from home. Because the way that I wrote the first one was by spending too much time with my wife. Too much. <laughs> so all of the subsequent ones are gonna benefit from that. And it's like, I've gotta finish my isolation stories before she starts working from home. Because if I don't finish my isolation stories before she starts working from home, I'm never gonna finish them. But the third thing, the third why of I'm not counting the number of books I've sold to try and propel me into specific series or storylines or whatever to to give people what they want is because I know if I did that, I would never be happy. <laughs> I'd never ever be happy. I'd never be happy with what I've done. I'd never be happy with what I was working on and have an existential crisis every other week about like, 
what if this isn't, this is not the thing people want? What if this is the thing people want? But wait, what if that's not the thing people want? And this is the thing people want instead. Um, and I just, that's just, that's just not reasonable. Um, <laughs> but also, I don't think that it's, that wouldn't allow me to do things like work on a third Guardian Cadet series book because I'll be honest, I know that's my worst selling book series. I know that people don't pick it up for some reason. Like people picked it up when it first came out, but now that it's been out for a couple of years, it doesn't seem to interest people. And I don't know if it's because like every other book that I've written centers non-binary characters and that's like the thing now. <laughs> And obviously that first book, that first book, that first series doesn't. Mary is a binary woman. Um, and that's that. Um, and I don't know if it's the fact that like, like if that's the pro problem with it that people have, or if they just don't like the aesthetic, or if I'm bad at pitching it, or if like, I don't know. I don't know if there's something there that I'm not quite clicking to make people interested in it or if it's just that the series isn't technically finished yet even though it's sort of technically was finished it's just oh it's just a nightmare <laughs> but i i see people pick it up at events they look at it they think it looks interesting they pick it up they read the blurb and they leave and i'm like is the blurb bad or they'll do the thing where they'll pick it up, they'll look at the blurb, they'll pick up a different book, look at that blurb, and they'll pick the second book. So like, they'll go from Mary Ellen Breaking the Curse to like, not the fighting kind, and they'll be like, ooh, not the fighting kind. Or they'll pick up Mary Ellen Breaking the Curse, and then they'll pick up Unlicensed Delivery, and they'll be like, ooh, Unlicensed Delivery. Or they'll pick up Mary Ellen Breaking the Curse, <laughs> see where this is going, and they'll pick up Welcome to Humanity, and then they'll go, ooh, Welcome to Humanity, and I don't know why. <laughs> But it's a thing, it's a visible thing that I'm seeing people do over and over and over again. And if I went through and I calculated my sales of books, of each individual book, I don't know whether that would help or hinder, because if I found out that the Guardian Cadet series doesn't sell very well overall, I'd feel really bad about it. And I probably would never finish it. And I wanna finish it, because I know I said that I wasn't gonna do it anymore. <laughs> But I was wrong. I just needed a break. And that also, therein lies another problem in that sometimes I need a break from things in order to be a creative person. Because writing is an art form as much as it's anything else. So, I don't count how many books I've sold. And Currently, I don't plan to. Maybe that will change. I'll let you know. <laughs> and if any of my books sound interesting, I'd love to point at them on my wall behind me, but they're not here right now uh, because, well, they are still where they are. I'm not where they are right now. Uh, but all of the links you need to find them are in the description box below, primarily the link to my website, which is willsoulspoonwithcraft.com, uh, which I assume you can't spell, which is why there's a link in the description box below. <laughs> <laughs> no one can spell it, don't worry about it. Um, uh, <laughs> so if any anything takes your interest, feel free to go and look. And as always, this channel is not monetized in any way, shape or form. So if you would like me to keep making these videos, you can always donate to my coffee account. The link for that is also in the description and on my website. Bye. Ah, oh, stuck. Well, that's an embarrassing ending, isn't it?